On 26 miles from Melbourne, oh, come along with me Down to the morning in Peninsula and Frankston Hello and welcome back to Frankston TV, I'm Ellie Cole. Frankston TV is also a community YouTube channel where people upload videos on what they love about Frankston. We pick the best videos and we make them into a TV series. Today we'll look at some exciting new developments in the Frankston City Centre, go behind the scenes with one of our most respected community groups, check out some spectacular action at our waterfront and I'm even going to tell you a little bit about my experience at the Paralympics. Now we're about to head around the corner for Wells Street's first farmer's market, so let's go and check it out. Sourdough bread, beautiful sourdough bread, it's all natural sourdough artisan bread. Shoulder. No worry, no worry. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, so Ellie. You bake all the local bread, let's have a taste. Yeah, we bake everything. Mm. It's all sourdough, it's all natural. Hi, we're having a great time here at the Frankston Market. I've already bought myself some goodies and enjoying it. <laughs> and some flowers. <laughs> And how can you choose Wells Street for your market? Well, the council came to us and said, look, we really want to have a street market. And if we close Wells Street, would you set a market up for us? And we, I said, absolutely. So here we are. And it's exciting. It's it brilliant. is. I'm having an excellent time. What do you think about the turnout today? I think it's really good. I think it was excellent. I, th I expected half of what we got today. And, and, but people came out, they didn't just look, they came to spend. And they spent money here. And, and that's, if people come out and spend money, everybody will come back and that's what it's about and it's like farmers markets is so people can find fresh food and they can you know they can walk out with an abundant feeling you know if they've just bought one loaf of bread and they bought a couple of broccoli or something it's like they've got that and they're actually supporting a local producer which is what we're trying to do if you haven't seen the frankston ladies choir sing you've been missing out but luckily, Frankston TV has gone behind the scenes to show you one of our great community talents. Okay. And if you say the word, two, three, four. And if you say the word, I could stay with you. Mental Health Week Q37 for the Art Exhibition. We are many, many, many here helping our you know clients to show a shiny side of themselves. Great we have the Come along, so be a part of it. My name is Peter Pickett. I'm 63 years old. I've been on Stalazine for 48 years. And I have uh, entered a work of art. My second form art teacher, Mrs Pace, said to me, Peter Pickett, you are completely void of musical and artistic talent. 
and every time I attempted to do a work of art, Mrs. Pace's words rung in my ear. And even something that is said in a flippant manner by a teacher can have such a profound effect on somebody late in life. I'm Dave Braceburg, CEO of Impact Support Services. We're one of the organisers of the Mental Health Week Frankston Art Show. It's fantastic. It's been going for so many years. What it does is allow all the crew that we deal with and other organisations deal with do art. And it's one thing to do art. It's lovely to go and see it on wall. So our crew get to see it on wall. Some of them get to sell stuff. It's a real recognition of what you do and it helps our guys. Um, art's a really important thing for our guys to help them in their recovery journey. I'm Brett Greener, I won an award for People's Choice. Yeah, this award really inspires me to continue with my art because without people to support, art would just be pointless. Pictures of my thing, you know, telling the story. Yeah, well, I'm struggling with depression and it just shows you how I feel, you know, the, uh, the colour symbolises the hope but you don't feel it. Well, for, for us, to me, is um, a way to get better. I'm here with Robbie from local cafe Eeny Meeny. Robbie, you've run cafes all over Melbourne, but tell us why you chose to open in Frankston. I've lived in the Frankston area for about 16 years and watched it change over time. Uh, I noticed more and more people like me who uh, spent their 20s in the city moving down, and I just think they wanted a more city-style cafe experience. All right, so you've seen the hustle and bustle obviously change in Frankston, you know, yeah. you've seen Frankston grow as a community. Tell us about, you know, the last 16 years and how much Frankston has really grown and what that means for your business. I think Frankston is now a really viable option uh, for people. It's affordable, um, it's got a bit of cool about it and for my business it means there's plenty of people who are looking for uh, the sort of cafe that I offer. Now, I, I noticed that you've received a small business grant from the Frankston City Council. Yes, we did. Tell us what that's meant to you and, and how it's really kick-started your business. Okay, the grant really put us probably two years ahead in our planning for things that we were able to do. Um, so we were able to do some intensive staff training, uh, a lot of marketing work where we developed some really cool postcards and business cards and um, uh, a video, which I think we'll see in a bit. In addition, we're able to finish off our courtyard out the back and make it all season, uh, heated, blinds, everything, so it survived the winter, which is good. Well, I want to know, where would you get your name for Eeny Meeny? Uh, we had, uh, well, what we wanted, a name that would um, make people remember their childhood, something a bit nostalgic, so we had a list of about 300 different names that were, you know, nursery rhymes, all sorts of things, and then we canvassed friends and got them to vote on it, and Eeny Meeny won. So Voting that's system. It. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in today and having a chat with us. Please. Now let's have a look at the Eeny Meeny clip.
So when I was two years old, I was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer called a neurosarcoma. Um, sarcomas are very unpredictable, they're a very aggressive type of cancer and unfortunately chemotherapy doesn't work on it and they haven't found a cure. So usually with sarcomas, the treatment is either drastic surgery or death. Obviously my parents didn't want to take the option of death so um, they chose to have my leg amputated to save my life. Um, before I had my leg amputated though, I went through a year of chemotherapy. Apparently I was diagnosed with a small bump behind my right knee and my mum thought that it was a spider bite and went to get it checked out and then found out that it was actually cancer. Um, and there, there, was a, there were a few errors in the way that they removed the tumour in terms of they didn't know which direction that it was growing in. So, you know, there were a few key areas where I guess a few mistakes were made and I always question if those mistakes were fixed if I would still have two legs or not. But to be honest, I don't really care if, I'll have, if I have two legs because I wouldn't be where I am today if I did. Fortunately, my parents made the decision to um, enrol me into swimming lessons to aid my rehabilitation and back into a normal lifestyle and that's how I got into swimming. So it's kind of something great that's come from a tragedy which I think is pretty cool. To be honest, when I was growing up with one leg I didn't really notice that I was different from any other kids. Um, my parents told me that I was just a normal kid and I had a twin sister who treated me exactly the same, you know, she took me under her arm at school and I guess showed me the ropes of how to do everything properly. Um, and I learned to adapt to everything, you know, I, I still played on the monkey bars, I still went down slides and everything. I did everything a normal kid did. Um, and I didn't notice that, you know, some kids were staring and, you know, some kids were pointing me out to their friends and saying what's wrong with that girl over there. Um, so growing up with one leg was a normal lifestyle for me, you know, I had obviously the odd problems every now and then. Um, my leg fell off once at school and it snapped in half once and that got me out of an assignment which was cool. Um, I misplaced my leg at school once which you think is hard to do but for a five year old it's quite easy to do and then my teacher had to go and find it for me. So uh, I was sitting um, on the oval and I had one of my friends ask me, oh, how, do you, how does your leg come off, you know, how do you wear it and he was very interested about the mechanics of it so I took it off and um, I ended up going to play on the playground for a little bit and then when I came back it wasn't there anymore and I was thinking who would hide a prosthetic leg like that's low and I had to get my sister to you know take me back to my classroom and my teacher's gone Ellie where's your leg gone and I'm going I don't know miss you're gonna have to find it for me <laughs> you know like when you're sick at school and you, you, your teacher sends you to go and see the nurse whenever my leg broke at school I had to go and see the school mechanic he was like <laughs> But apart from that, you know, I just had a normal childhood. I guess my semi-serious swimming career started when I was about 10 or 11. You know, I wasn't yet in high school, but I'd finished my Learn to Swim um, program at King's. I'd graduated and my mum asked me what I wanted to do with my life, which is a silly question to ask a 10 year old. And she asked me if I wanted to do squad swimming. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll go give it a try. And I went to um, Frankston High School swimming pool and I jumped in and my coach, Russell Parsons, was a Melbourne Demons supporter and I was a Melbourne Demons supporter. Go the Ds. And um, he treated anyone that supported the Ds, you know, like they were a queen or a king. So I got treated really well in my first training session just because of that small factor that my coach went for the Demons. And I think that's where my swimming career started was from that, which I think is amazing. But you know, I kept going back and back and back and um, I never really thought that I wanted to be a Paralympian. Like I'd seen it on the TV before and obviously I wanted to go, but it was never a big goal of mine. And you know, I was just improving every time I swam. You know, I always tried to fix something being a perfectionist and eventually my technique, you know, was close to perfect and you know, my fitness levels were going up and you know, I was climbing the rankings in Australia and all of a sudden I was at the top before I knew it, which was pretty amazing. You know, when I was in year nine, I was only 14 years of age and I went to the World Championships trials um, at the end of the year in 2006 in South Africa and Durban and um, it was a very exciting time for me. 
you know, I was only 14 and I was in a team full of, you know, 20 year olds. So I was around people that were much more mature than me and I got to experience a completely different side of life. You know, I was a kid that was training with 10 to 12 year olds, you know, at a pool in Frankston that was 25 metres um, and overheated because it was used for learn to swim primarily. You know, from going from a, an atmosphere like that to a world championships atmosphere within a week is, you know, quite overwhelming. And I went over there and won a silver medal, which was very exciting. And that's kind of when Swimming Australia thought that I could have some potential and really started putting some work into me. But when I came home, you know, I'd been on such a high for so long that I came home and I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I didn't, you know, know where to put all my energy into because I was having a break from swimming. And that's when, you know, things started turning really bad. You know, I stopped turning up to school. I started talking back to my teachers. Um, I stopped turning up to training. My mum thought that I was on drugs, which I wasn't, but she thought I was because I was, you know, acting so, I guess, irrationally and, you know, I was pretty much uncontrollable for a good two years of my life there. You know, the transition from primary school to high school really wasn't that different to what I was used to. I knew that someone was going to have a go at me for having one leg. I just knew it was bound to happen eventually and it actually happened on the first day. Um, a kid called Zach came up to me and said, oh, pirate, what are you doing, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, that's not that offensive, but that's not on. <laughs> and I took my leg off and I threw it at him like a javelin, thinking that, you know, being in drama class, it would have been socially acceptable to do something like that. It's quite a dramatic way to deal with something. And um, everyone just, you know, mouths open, shocked that I'd done that. And I think a kind of a wave of, um, fear went through the class that, oh my goodness, I better not mess with that girl, she will throw her leg at me. <laughs> so, um, you know, obviously I don't condone violence, but there was that only, there's only been one time when I've used my prosthetic leg as a weapon. You know, when I was 12 years old, I thought I had a very normal lifestyle. Um, I thought that, you know, having protein shakes after training, um, having ice baths and physio and massage and everything like that, was a normal lifestyle for a 12 year old. And it wasn't until I moved to the Australian Institute of Sport when I was 19 or 18. And I started talking to other athletes about, you know, what they did when they were young, younger athletes and younger kids. And, you know, they didn't start taking all their proteins and recovery methods and everything until they were about 17 or 18. So um, I think from a very young age, my parents were setting me up to be an elite athlete and I didn't even realise it at the time until I was 18 that that was happening. I was at the Beijing Paralympic Trials all of a sudden. I was really nervous there because I wasn't prepared like I should have been. And you know, that's when you get the most nervous is when you know you haven't done the work. That's why I usually get nervous anyway. Um, I still managed to make the team somehow for the Beijing Paralympic Games and I was the youngest swimmer on the team and I went to the games a couple of months later after a lot of training, you know, I really buckled down after that and really applied myself. Um, went to the games, it was very overwhelming. I have this one memory um, of Beijing, it was right before I won my silver medal which was my very first um, medal that I'd won at the games and I was sitting in the call room and I was really nervous obviously. Um, and I have a really unstable knee. And if I have any material gather behind my knee, it will usually dislocate. And back then, you know, we wore the this racing bears that went all the way down to the ankles. And I, I put, you know, my, my leg up on the chair and all this material gathered behind my knee and dislocated my knee right before I was gonna walk out for my race. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I've just dislocated my knee and I'm about to swim 100 meters butterfly. That's not a good thing at all. But um, I actually found it very interesting that when you are competing at an event like that, you have so much adrenaline running through you that you don't feel anything anyway, so it didn't affect me. It's not the knee that dislocates, sorry, it's the kneecap. You know, when you walk out into the um, competition area, you have to walk through the warm-up area to get there. And I watched the TV as I was walking through it, and I saw Matt Cowdery had just won his, his race. And I was thinking, oh wow, Matt's just won his race, that's really exciting. You know, I'm very proud of him, go, go Australia. And then I'm thinking, uh-oh, if Matt Cowdery has just won his race, it means that my race is up next. I'm thinking this isn't good, I'm not even in the core room. And you're meant to be in the core room half an hour before your race starts, so I'm thinking I'm stuffed. So I quickly ran, or hopped, or whatever, I was, I was on crutches. I crutched my way <laughs> to the core room. And right when I walked in, I burst through the doors and I was saying, you know, Ellie call for Australia, I'm here for my race, it's up next, it's up next. 
And right when I walked in, I saw you know the last summer of my race walking out onto the pool deck, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I've just you know missed my race. And the, the lady was um, on a little microphone, and she said, I'll, I'll be with you in a second. And she went off and spoke to someone through a headset, and said that you can't go on because it will look bad on TV. And I just you know obviously wasn't very happy with that. So I got to go to bed quite early that night. I was obviously upset, but it gave me enough energy to compete for the rest of the week and you know win two more medals. So. But Ellie has taken control now. Ellie Cole of Australia, ready to win gold with 15 metres to go. And now she's a champion as well. She's a gold medalist. Gold to Ellie Cole of Australia. Taking the gold medal. It's going to be a new world record. Three seconds inside the record. One group of people who really love our shallow waters are skimboarders from all over Melbourne. To finish this episode, let's take a look at some of their spectacular tricks. <laughs> 